Albert Einstein can easily be considered the, cent the 20th century's greatest mind. After all, he was voted the man of the century by Time magazine. And Einstein's favorite way of thinking was the thought experiment. So in honor of Albert Einstein, we'll be performing a thought experiment. In this first scenario, you are a student, and you're entering a science class, awaiting an hour-long lecture for your teacher to spit facts at you until you ultimately become bored or resent science. In this next scenario, you're a student, and you're STEM-driven, and you aspire to, pr to pursue a path in STEM. You're in the same exact classroom, but you feel that you may be missing something. Please take a moment to reflect upon whether either scenario best describes your attitude towards science. Something that both of these groups have in common is their misconception of what science is. What's taught in science class is not what all of science is. The reason why your view of what science is, is differs from what science is in reality comes down to the way that science is taught to students. Students learn science in a very concrete and dry way. And what I mean by this is that science is taught as a summation of facts, when in reality, it's more of a way of thinking. Now, I'm not saying that the scientific body of knowledge is not important. It's actually very important, but it's not what's definitive of science. What constitutes science is both the established fact and scientific reasoning with the scientific method. STEM classes are teaching students scientific facts, but they aren't teaching them how to think like a scientist. While it's true, certain STEM classes do perform labs. These differ from actual research and that there's little room for creative input or modification of experimental setup. These labs are more so demonstrations than actual experimentation, which is valuable, but isn't an actual experiment. To exemplify my point as science as a way of thinking, let's consider music as an, as an analogy. Music students oftentimes learn the notes, but more importantly, they learn the technique to, to the notes. Without this technique, the musical phrase is just a bland permutation of notes. Once they've mastered the technique, they then apply it to new and more complicated songs. They could potentially even make their own new songs. Who knows? The possibilities are really limitless. This is actually similarly the case with science. Science has its own mu musical notes, the scientific body of knowledge, and it has its own technique, which is scientific reasoning. And scientific reasoning is constituted by questioning and, questioning and testing different ideas, hypotheses, and theories. STEM classes are teaching students the notes, but aren't teaching them the technique. There are some schools of thought in music that believe in only teaching the notes. This wouldn't work as well in the case of science, although, because the, although the notes are, although the technique is important, the notes are still needed in order to initiate questions and to explain results. The pure drilling of facts suppresses the ability to be curious and think like a scientist. If you're not going to believe me, believe Albert Einstein, who said, it's a miracle that curiosity survives a formal education. Being able to question and play with different ideas in science is a very important part of, of the scientific technique. Unfortunately, it'd be very difficult to change the educational system for various different reasons that I'm not going to be getting into. But this pure drilling of facts is most prominent in some of the primary science courses, which is why those of you who feel indifferent or resent science feel the way you do. And for this reason, I believe that everybody likes science at some level. This is because they haven't experienced it. But more importantly, science attempts to question and understand how the universe works at a fundamental level. So anything that you like that exists in the universe has its roots in science. Science reveals a whole new layer of understanding and beauty to the universe. I encourage those of you who said you're not a fan of science to apply scientific reasoning to any body of knowledge that you'd like to. And I think you'll find a variety of different interesting questions and topics to explore. That's the way science works, and science works everywhere. 
since schools aren't going to foster our curiosity and they aren't going to develop, us, develop scientific thinking skills, we have to take this matter into our own hands. I noticed this difference between the science classroom and the science, re and science research when I started working at an astrophysics cosmology lab at the University of California, San Diego. Unfortunately, not many people have opportunities as I did in professional research settings, but that doesn't mean you can't foster your own curiosity. There are actually a variety of different ways that people could do this. I have some advice and information that may prove useful for you, for those of you who would like to pursue STEM or who would just like to further develop your scientific thinking skills. One tool of great importance is a programming language. Programming languages open the door to a whole new world of problem solving, which is precisely why they're such an important tool. With the right programming language, you can solve many problems. I noticed a preference towards the programming language Python, so that's just one of the languages that I know. Another tool of great importance is mathematics. Now this may seem kind of obvious. We use mathematics to analyze data, predict the event, the occurrence of different events, and so on. But it's really important to fundamentally and conceptually understand the, the mathematics that you're using when modeling different systems, rather than just going through the motions of computation. That's why we have computers. And another tool of importance is being able to visualize the physical parameters that you're trying to test. By doing this, you open the door to, you, you, by doing this, you allow yourself to view the physical parameters in new and different ways. Behind me, you'll see a picture of an instrument that I developed called to measure the polarization of light at UCSD. I, I could go on and on about all the different great experiences that I've had at the research facility, but I also have some advice beyond the research facility. And one particular event is science fair. Science fair is a great place to grow your interest in science and, and practice the scientific method. One of the many great things about science fair is that the students have a lot of freedom. As a result, students can test anything they want to, any way they want to. This ultimately makes science more interesting, personal, and engaging. Science fair also sharpens the data analysis skills, interpretive skills, data presentation skills, and science writing skills. Students are required to take their own measurements and properly analyze their own data by themselves. This is, a, this is finally tested by a judge who provides critical feedback and insight onto the student's research project. But importantly, students are able to practice actual scientific writing. Science fair requires many different different types of science literature that are common in those found in, found in actual scientific publications. One example of this is the abstract. The abstract is required by all science, science fairs and it is in every single scientific literature. So it's of great importance to know how to write one. One could do similarly by doing an independent research project aside from science fair. This would practice the same skill set Although there aren't any judges or big awards, you still get the overall gist of becoming more curious and developing your scientific reasoning skills. But it can sometimes be difficult to be curious about different topics. So a good place to look, at, uh, to look for inspiration is in the modern development of the field. I happen to be passionate about physics, so I'll particularly be focusing on modern physics but this should work for any field of interest. In modern physics, there are a variety of different questions and ideas that are being developed, so it's, it's a lot, very easy to see how one might become curious. Science textbooks, journals, and publications are all great places to look for inspiration, but it's important not to lose these, these questions and ideas that you've developed. So I've, so I've developed a system where I write them down in a journal and I know that I'll have these forever since they're written down. Overall, this has made me a more curious person and, and has allowed me to grow as a scientist. Hopefully, you could do similarly by exploring your own curiosities. Albert Einstein, the greatest thinker of the 20th century, 
had three big blunders in quantum mechanics, in cosmology, and in quantum mechanics and, and cosmology. So why is he considered such, such a great scientist? One of the reasons is because of his genius, but most importantly, it's because he was curious and he was able to scientifically reason. The ultimate goal of all of the advice that I've given you is so that you can foster your passion for science and grow as a scientist. And hopefully you can go from not only learnings about science, but to making new science too. Thank you.